In one incident a number of years ago, a trans woman in the Bronx was walking with her boyfriend when a vice officer uh, pulled up and stopped them. They found a small amount of weed on him and let him go. They found two condoms on her and arrested her for solicitation. So police are stopping and questioning trans people for protected First Amendment activity. The way they look, what they're wearing, where they're standing, and where they're gathering with friends, and not on the basis of illegal activity. If trans women happen to live or be visiting friends in a neighborhood where sex workers have previously worked, then all trans women who are present in that area end up being profiled as engaging in sex work. And the most marginalized members of the LGBT community are targeted for the most egregious and disturbing abuses like sexual assault. Um, a 2014 report of LGBT youth in New Orleans found that 59% of trans youth surveyed had been asked for a sexual favor by police in New Orleans, along with 12% of non-trans LGBTQ youth. And in a recent study of sex workers in Baltimore, more than half of trans sex workers reported being sexually harassed or assaulted by police. And nearly half reported that police had been their clients in the past three months. Now, to, be, to have a, a, an officer as your client is an inherently abusive relationship. There's a power disparity that just can't be overcome. So, um, for example, if an LGBT youth were standing with their friends and hanging out, an officer could approach and say, what are you doing? And they would say, mind your business. That might be seen as a threat. And if they're black, an officer might raise their voice and, you know, pull a taser out, pull a baton out. And a, a young person who is seeing an officer with a weapon might justifiably want to depend, defend themselves. They could be charged with disorderly conduct. Uh, they could be charged with disturbing the peace. They could be charged with loitering. They could would likely be assaulted in some way by that officer in that engagement. And if they tried to reach for the officer's baton or taser, the officer might pull up pull out a gun. Uh, these these interactions are incredibly volatile. They can start with absolutely nothing, with people minding their own business, but because of the training that officers receive, because of the aggressive nature of policing, every interaction can be a powder keg. And the more marginalized a, person, a person's identities are, um, the more layered and explosive that interaction can be. Are we good? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, when I um, uh, I worked on a report that looked at the uh, police department policies com uh, compared to a model that Andrea was foundational in creating uh, uh, that really looked at the interactions between law enforcement and trans and gender nonconforming people, and we looked at the largest police departments, and it was it was just uh, very devastating and indicative of why um, of how systemic and rooted in the prejudice and discrimination from law enforcement, uh, maybe even just departments of culture in there is towards our, our communities and specifically black folks in our community. Um, I'd like to move it over to Andrea. And I mean, obviously, Andrea, I think you're you're one in a million here. Um, not everyone has the, the depth of knowledge and understanding and, and like have experience of actually being there when all of the foundation, a lot of the foundational work that we use today in our movement was created. Um, and, and I mean, you've been at the intersection of policing, women and girls, LGBTQ advocacy. And while we don't have much time to go over all of it, um, I would like for you to share some of the advocacy tactics and strategies that the LGBTQ movement has used, specifically to reduce the harms brought upon by the police. Um, so essentially, like, I want to give these staffers an, a crash course on, like, what we've tried before, what the barriers we saw, and kind of, like, where we were at as a result of that, that work. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mateo. Um... I was born in 1969, but I wasn't at the uprising. Um, and so, uh, but what I've seen tried um, since then, and what I've also written about um, other folks organizing in a book called Queer Injustice, the Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States, which will be the, well, I don't have to say all the things because they're in there, um, is that what started as an organizing movement at Stonewall very quickly became a policy 
um, focused movement and that for a long time the policy work that we did was about increasing punishments for people who hurt us. And what we've understood is that that hasn't stopped people from hurting us. Um, and in fact, some of those laws have been turned against us um, many, many times. And so um, when I came on the scene, what we were trying to do is change policy and so and to reduce the harm of police interactions. So one of the first things I did was try and change a search policy for trans folks in Toronto and then litigated in New York City against the police department and did a comprehensive change of their policies in terms of interactions with trans people. Fast forward um, eight years since those policies were enacted, not much has changed. Um, similarly, I've litigated and won you know, cases that were groundbreaking around recognizing that uh, discrimination against LGBT people or trans people particularly deserve heightened scrutiny when they're um, undertaken by the police. Again, nothing changed in terms of the day-to-day -day police interactions. Um, and so I think what I wanna say in terms of what we've learned is that at this point, the reason I work at an, uh, an organization called Interrupting Criminalization is that we've learned that this system historically has been set up not only to police race and poverty, but also to police the borders of gender and, that it, and to police sexuality, and that it will continue to do so. It's, found, it's as foundational to policing as anti-blackness is and as colonialism and anti-indigeneity and anti-poor people-ness is. And so that essentially efforts to sort of tweak that or try and fix that or try and get them to do it less often or differently or uh, more infrequently are not gonna actually change material conditions for LGBTQ people, particularly who are homeless, trans, black, indigenous, um, et cetera. And so, uh, disabled for sure. And so at this point, interrupting criminalization is about literally keeping the cops out of our lives. It's about interrupting the point of contact and reducing the points of contact, focusing on decriminalization, diversion, decarceration, divestment from policing, dismantling police departments, and dreaming things that will actually keep our communities safe, that will actually make LGBTQ people, and particularly Black and Brown LGBTQ people, and particularly Black trans people safe, because those things will make all of us safe. So that's been the trajectory of my 20 years, um, and I think one that younger organizers have made much more quickly, and that we're seeing on the ground, that people have seen investigations, reform, policy change, departments that may score um, well on your metric about their policy on paper for trans people, but in practice are doing very poorly and are killing black people every day. And so that we have to sort of recognize that we're living at those intersections and fight at those intersections, which means actually shrinking police to zero and building safety for LGBTQ people to a thousand. Thank you so much. Does anybody want to follow up on that? That was amazing. Um, yes. Um, I'm really excited. Um, Puni, a quick question, not so quick question for you. Um, so you spent, you said, you mentioned you spent 10 years of, of your career uh, at the Department of Justice suing police departments for civil rights violations. That's it. That was a, the point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm just kidding. Um, so I, I do want folks to understand what that looked like. So can you give us a window into what the process and outcomes look like at what you were doing when you were suing these police departments? Like, what did accountability look like? Um, and can we as a community and as sales staffers rely on the Department of Justice to implement the changes that are necessary to ensure our safety as a community? So I think this actually supports um, everything Andrea just said, uh, because the consent decrees that, you know, DOJ does, yes, they're important that it's a tool, but there are 18,000 plus law enforcement departments in the country. And can you imagine the number of attorneys it would take to oversee that many police departments? Um, and policing is local. All policing is local. So, and even when an agency is investigated and, and when everything goes according to plan and successfully and everyone reaches a consent decree and it's 200 pages and 300 pages and includes everything from policies and training and accountability systems, everything. I mean, A, those are incredibly expensive. So in Baltimore, schools don't have heat. And the police department already is 40 to 60% of the city budget. And we've just now required 
the police department to do more and the schools still don't have heat. And the standard for getting out of a consent decree is to not be systematically violating people's constitutional rights. That's not a really high standard, uh, but that, that is what's required. And that's what gets you into a consent decree is if you are systematically violating people's constitutional rights. That's a completely failing department. And to get out of that, you just need to be able to, it's not that there's no misconduct, there can still be a small amount of misconduct, but for a short period of time, you can show a court that you fixed your problems, you, whether, it's through, whether it's through policies or training. Um, but it's short term, because a court is not gonna oversee those consent decrees for a very long time. Generally, the requirement to sustain uh, the standards is one to three years, and then the court will release the department from the consent decree. LAPD went through a consent decree in the 90s after Rodney King. And we've seen um, in the protests that there are still problems. We've seen before the protests that there were, there were still problems. And I think one of the main goals of the consent decree that's, that might matter is that it's intended to make police departments more transparent and accountable so that local communities can hold it accountable long-term. So to document what officers are doing and report out to the public about that. So local community members can say, that's not okay. We want our money back and we wanna invest it in healthcare. And actually in, in, even in the 10 to 20 years that DOJ has been doing pattern of practice investigations, um, the DOJ was shifting towards a model where identifying that police were involved in too many aspects of people's lives and where they're not the best first responders. And law enforcement will agree that police shouldn't be responding to incidents of where people are in crisis. Uh, you need mental health experts. And so the Baltimore Consent Decree actually included a gap analysis for the city to identify exactly what the population uh, needed in terms of mental and behavioral health care so that funding could be provided for community-based services and peer support services. Um, and officers wouldn't have to respond. You can direct calls to 911 and shift those to mental health responders. So I, I think even the DOJ was recognizing that, you know, there's only so much you can do through the police department and the problems we see are because of a lack of city infrastructure to respond to residents' overall needs. And police officers aren't the answer um, the vast majority of the time. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that it's, it's really important what you're talking about, like the fact that we, we need to remember that policing is local and we need to provide the resources for folks that can actually hold these people accountable in a sustainable way. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I'd like to shift it over to Mickey. Based on uh, what Andrea just shared and what Puneet just shared, um, and the fact that we're 51 years uh, post Stonewall, like, and this is a two part question, one short one and one longer. Um, so what are your thoughts on how far we've come or not? Um, and are we living in, in the vision that our, our trans ancestors, trans sisters wanted for us? Mm. I think, but going back to what um, Andrea raised as bringing up the, the visions, right? The bold visions that we really have for replacing um, punitive systems with systems that heal and, and, and repair harm. Um, I follow the leadership of Black trans-led organizations like Solutions Not Punishment Coalition, who are currently in a fight to transform the city detention center into a center for wellness. And uh, the Atlanta city mayor, Mayor Bottoms, just announced today that she would see this vision through by reallocating those funds. Um, although we're still demanding a date for when the jail will actually be closed. Um, and this is important because we've seen, as Andrea said, reform after reform go unenforced, get gutted, torn down. 
Um, and I think the lesson here is that quick solutions will really only lead us to temporary results. I believe that if we continue to divest from policing, we can address the root causes of crime and violence. Um, and we know that, you know, Marsha and Sylvia knew that housing, healthcare, community support, these are the ways that um, we build long-term solutions to violence. So we are absolutely living in the vision our ancestors wanted for us. People are across the country tearing down monuments to colonizers, right? And so how beautiful would it be if in the place of those monuments, we erected monuments to the Black trans women who taught us how to fight for marginalized people, right? Thank you. And, and a follow up to that, um, you, it, along with a coalition of, of trans and gender nonconforming folks from across the country and from a spectrum of identities, worked and put together a, a vision for liberation that launched this year. Um, can you give us a little bit of background on, on what's included in that vision, um, why it's so necessary, and, and, and basically like what we're calling for? Absolutely. Um... So the, the, the Trans Agenda for Liberation was started by um, a coalition of trans and gender nonconforming folks, um, mostly led by Black, migrant, and indigenous trans leaders, um, formed in 2014 by the Transgender Law Center and Trans Justice Funding Project. Um, and initially we came together just to, to strategize around the increase in bills that were criminalizing trans people's access to public space. Um, I, it was mainly around bathrooms. Um, but since then the coalition um, has grown to represent um, trans leaders from Hawaii, the Deep South, the Midwest, Pacific Northwest, um, and through a lot of several multi-day convenings, we developed a skeleton of a living document that we think addresses the urgent political, legal, and social violence enacted against our communities while also trying to channel that trans imagination, right, of what could be possible, what, what in our boldest dreams, what do we really envision, what do we really want? Instead of asking for what we think we can get, why don't we ask for what we actually want and need deeply? Um, and I will say that um, the tradition of um, making these agendas, right, and making them known um, is a longstanding Black tradition in the, the radical Black movement. Um, and we followed suit from the Movement for Black Lives and their policy table. Um, but we wanted to take it a little bit further as it applies to trans people. Um, and so we looked at what are our values, right? Our values are our actual demands. Um, our values, our demands are that Black trans women and Black trans femmes are able to lead and able to live as fiercely as they should be able to, right? We demand a world where Indigenous cultural practices, land and body sovereignty are respected, where trans people are never forced to leave our homes, where we have the freedom of movement to seek out our own belonging, migration is not criminalized, we also know that trans people deserve intergenerational connections and lifelong care, right? From the moment that we are trans youth to when we become elders, right? And our, our wisdom is, is valued. And we're demanding a world where the healthcare we need is readily available, where our bodies, our HIV statuses, our disabilities, our viral loads are no longer policed and criminalized. It's really um, a very comprehensive living and loving document um, that folks can take a look at. Um, we also recently released a care package inspired by the agenda that includes poems and art and music and just inspiration um, for people who are out there fighting. So I'll link that below as well. Um, but this is really just uh, the beginning of a blueprint for how we can really prioritize the, the leadership of those who are most affected, who are most marginalized in our communities, um, who hold so much knowledge about how these systems fail them and really fail all of us actually, right? Because if black trans women and black trans men are not free, no one's free. Everyone is oppressed, right? 
Perfect. Thank you. And and I did see that Andrea shared some of the uh, links on the chat. Uh, so feel free to go and look at that, folks. And and again, thanks so much for all all your work and and the 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 work and the intention that goes behind convening a group of us as trans and gender nonconforming people. Um, so I, I just want to personally appreciate all the labor that went into that. Um, I do want to move over to Andrea um, and see if you can help us understand a little bit more around terminology. Um, so there's there's a lot of conversations around dominating, even like the news cycle around like reform, divest, defund, dismantle, abolish. Um, so can you help folks make sense of this? And, and can you share your thoughts on what is needed to end police violence against our communities? Certainly. Um, we're coming out today with a tool for this at Interrupting Criminalization, so I'll be sure to share it with folks so you can pass it on along with a lot of the resources in the chat um, and a fact sheet also on LGBT experiences of policing that summarizes a lot of what Puneet was sharing. But um, essentially, I think we're seeing four different sort of conversations right now. We're seeing budget cuts to police departments, and I think that's we're in an economic crisis. We cities are on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, we're facing the biggest economic crisis of our generation. Uh, it's fairly easy at this point to argue that things need to be cut. And in the current political climate, people are particularly pointing out that we're get slashing healthcare in New York City. One of the first things that was slashed in the budget in the middle of the pandemic was healthcare. Um, we're slashing youth programs and education where people are trying to learn at home with no internet and no, you know, supports for community and parents. And we're slashing summer youth programs when young people have been cooped up inside for months. And meanwhile, police budgets are staying the same. Housing budgets are being slashed. Everything we need to survive this pandemic um, and to survive this economic crisis is being cut and police budgets are being left alone or increased. So I think people are, that's an argument for like, no, they should be cut. Now, some people are just sort of arguing for commensurate cuts for police departments and stopping there. That's sort of the budgetary argument. Then there's a defund argument that's saying, actually what we mean is defund the police, fund the people um, and defend black lives while we're doing it. And that is about defunding the police department and moving the money to the things that we need to survive that, that uh, Michaela just described um, so beautifully in the tradition of what um, our ancestors, Marsha P and Sylvia um, taught us. And that's not just also shrinking money from the police department, but it's shrinking power, it's shrinking scope of work, it's pulling them out of schools to the question that was asked earlier about um, law enforcement presence in schools is impacting uh, LGBT youth. I mean, it just means that literally the policing of gender that happens outside then moves into the school and the policing of sexuality that happens outside moves into the school, such that if you're a young person, you're exploring, what would it be like to maybe kiss a girl? I remember being very excited about this question. Um, the police are in the hallways, either asking you questions about it or giving you a ticket or disciplining you for that. And if you are dressing in a way that they find inappropriate based on what they think your gender expression should be, they're policing about that. And then if people at school are attacking you, and you defend yourself, they're policing you about that. And they're not policing or protecting you from the attacks that you're experiencing at school. So, um, and one thing that folks haven't thought about, we talked a bit about police sexual violence, police presence in school produces a tremendous amount of sexual violence, including against trans folks. So people in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, are not only saying cut the police budget, um, and we're following their lead, they're saying they got the police out of schools, and not just out of elementary and high schools, but also out of their universities. So I think it's shrinking budget, shrinking scope, um, shrinking function, shrinking power, and shrinking police contact. And that's what you know we were talking about earlier: is that all the all the conversation, all the interactions that Puneet described, the only way to make sure that they don't produce violence is to make sure they don't happen at all. And so that's the defund strategy. And the defund strategy comes with an invest strategy in the things that will actually make us safe. That is not defund to a point, but we'll keep a core of this that, you know, will continue to form some core functions. We're defunding to zero. And I think we've had sort of pundits try and reframe our demands. We've had elected officials try and reframe our demands. We've had media try and reframe our demands. No, we are defund to zero. And we are increased funding to things that keep black trans women safe to as much as it needs until we get there, because then we'll all be safe. Um, and then what that means is dismantling a police department and investing in many of the things that already exist but don't get anywhere near the resources the police department gets or any at all that keep us safe 
um, and black trans women have those networks, black queer folks have those networks, queer folks have those networks, because we've never been able to rely on the police for our safety. So let's put some resources in those and build them up, and then that's going to be the infrastructure that will flower in its place. And then abolition is the, the end result, and I think what people um, what we're really cautioning is that let's not just move policing somewhere else. So let's not just say now we're going to not have a police department, but we're going to have a mental health department that runs around and shackles people and incarcerates them and makes them take Haldol or mandates them into drug treatment, whether they need it or not, or um, polices their gender and sexuality as social workers, guidance counselors, doctors, nurses, and uh, any number of professions and agencies have done to us before. So abolition is not just about um, abolishing the institutions of policing or prisons or jail or detention. It's also abolishing the values that produce them and the notion that any, anyone who does those things is doing anything but creating violence as opposed to harm. So it's a spectrum. And certainly if you're fighting for a budget cut, great. Fight for that budget cut, you're helping us on the road but don't call it defund if you're not calling for investment also. And if you're fighting for defund, um, great, um, call it that, it's investment and it's on the road to what we're doing. But if you're not actually thinking about reducing the scope and role and power of police, then don't call it defund, call it a budget cut <laughs> and, and so on. So we're really asking people to be very precise in their language. You can be allied to this struggle, even if you're not all the way at abolition, but let's make sure that we don't co-opt certain concepts and terms, and let's make sure that we get out of the way of folks who are trying to build safety for Black trans women because they are calling for abolition. That was one of the most amazing breakdowns uh, in, in such a succinct way, and I think every single person on this appreciates you for that. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so I do want to go back. There's a, a, a question for anyone that wants to answer. So obviously, like most of, of the folks here are in their are here in their capacity as uh, legislative staffers. So um, they want to know what they can do to help address discrimination, violence, and harassment. So what would you recommend that they do or learn more about? Um, and and I want to encourage your responses to move beyond that. Well, you you should make an amendment to this, or you should introduce a bill that this. I think this is broader conversation around a culture shift and fundamentally changing the ways in which our public servants can demand liberation alongside us and be in allyship with us. Um, so I know that the caucus has endorsed uh, the uh, uh, representative Ayanna Presley's uh, People's uh, Justice Guarantee, um, which is a, a, a bold move that uh, the Equality Caucus doesn't necessarily uh, take that often. So it's really great to see that, 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 that the members that, that are involved in the caucus are taking such a strong position. Um, but this is an open question. Um, what, what are some things that staffers can, can hold on to as they walk away from this, this time? I can jump in and then stop talking after this because I know I just spoke a lot, but I just really, the message I want to say is this is not the time for solutions of the past that have failed us. This is not the time for that. This is the time for solutions of the future in which the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Tony McDade would not be possible. And so we're really going to be looking for folks who are going to be champions and partners in putting forth legislation that reflects that reality. Um, and we're going to be looking to this caucus because um, what you've already endorsed has a lot of key elements in it that um, live at, that address the intersections that we've been talking about. And so we're going to really be calling on you to step up and and um, help us move those things forward. Um, I just the thing I want to say too is the thing that will not help us, the thing that will hurt us that we're asking you not to do is to push for data provisions, uh, data collection provisions um, that would require law enforcement officers to collect data or anyone in the criminal punishment or any of the policing systems I just mentioned to collect information about people's sexual orientation and gender identity because that is going to give police officers more power, more scope, more ability to engage in the interactions that Puneet described, that Mickey described, that I described, that we don't want them to be engaged in. And to put also in the current political climate in a government database, a notation of what we said our sexual orientation and gender identity is or what they think it is. And while that was dangerous under the Obama administration, that is deadly now. And so we cannot have that happen. So I know that people want to see LGBT folks reflected in these bills in some way and that that's a way that people are thinking that they might want to do it. And I just want to just, I will call you. You can call me anytime, day or night. I will talk to you as long as it takes to help understand that that is going to hurt so many queer folks and that is not helpful. And what is helpful is already in the People's Justice Guarantee 
that you have already endorsed. So look to that and I'm going to pass the mic check. Thank you. Uh, Puneet or Mickey? I'll just add real quickly that my sound wasn't working at the outset, so I didn't get to say how honored I am to be on this panel with Andrea and Michaela. Uh, you guys are such an inspiration. Your organizations are such an inspiration, and you too, Mateo, of course. Um, love working with you all the time. Um, so I'm, I'm just honored to be part of this panel and, and second everything Michaela and Andrea said. It's also great to be here with me. Um, yeah, I... I, it's hard to follow what Andrea said, but um, I think we really have a duty um, to shift culture, right? We really have a duty in this moment. This moment is really calling us to shift from a culture that really takes the easy route in punishing folks, right? We take the easy route in punishing and sending people away and sort of disappearing folks into prisons um, and disappearing our problems onto the police. Um, who also don't know how to deal with these issues. And so I just think that, you know, if we are a movement that champions um, the message that love wins, then let us really be a movement that champions the message that love wins, that love wins over punishment, that love is, is, a, is something that allows us um, to ask not just who harmed who and what should their punishment be, but what is, what is the thing that actually caused this person to cause this harm, right? What are the social determinants, the access or lack of access that supported this harm? And how do we create a world where that harm is no longer possible because that need is filled? I think those are the questions that I think about often, um, particularly when it comes to uh, the murders of Black trans women, particularly at the hands of police, particularly in, in instances of intimate partner violence. Um, I think about what, it, what are the, the things that are going on through not just the heads of the victims, but the heads of those who cause harm, right? Um, and I think that we really have to, I'll, I'll just say it again, yeah, we need to really invest in community-based alternatives. And, and if you don't um, have a sense of, of what those can be, the list is long. It's funding violence prevention. It's, it's creating access to safe and affordable housing. It's you know, providing access to affordable and accessible transportation. Like it's, it's all the things that, that make life easier <laughs> for folks. Um, and I'll also say that you know, um, the Transgender Law Center was not always taking on decriminalization work. Um, it has been a long road for us. It has been a long trajectory for us to get to the point where we recognize that these are the things um, that are keeping our people from being able to be protected and, and live safe and healthy lives. And so we really have to just invest in these long-term solutions, divest from criminalizing survival, divest from criminalizing sex work and HIV and substance abuse and invest in communities and community leaders. And in that, we are building towards the Black trans futures that make everything else possible. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do think that some folks um, probably wanted clear cut recommendations as I feel like most briefings do provide. Um, I think that it's great that you don't get that from us. Um, except what we really don't want you to do, which Andrea already talked about. Um, but I, I think that you should look at that and, and explore that with curiosity. Um, what is transformative justice? What would actually benefit the communities that we're, we're trying to serve or that we're seeing are largely impacted by um, violence in general, but specifically police brutality um, in, in, in our society? Um, I do want to see if Laura has any questions from the audience that you could share with us. I do. Thank you so much for asking. So if you want to direct this to whoever you think would be more appropriate, um, there's a question here about how we can reduce the harm done to TGNC people in gendered prisons. Sounds like a question from Mateo in black and pink. <laughs> Yes. Um, so how can we reduce the harms? Um, first, I would say um, that 
there's a million reasons why trans people are incarcerated that they shouldn't be incarcerated for, period. Um, so decarceration would be my number one uh, thing that I would point you to. But there's a million different ways in which a trans person who is incarcerated experiences violence while incarcerated. It could be everything from interpersonal violence to the, the sheer conditions of confinement that they're in. Um, I think that the most uh, prevalent thing that some folks have been um, uh, probably heard about is the fact that like trans people are not placed in the appropriate facilities that align with where they feel safest. And I say that because the standard should definitely be a person should be placed based on where they feel safest, not based on their gender identity, because even when we have these facilities, they are gendered and they are exclusively male or female facilities in name uh, because we do have trans people of different identities in them. And that just completely leaves out a bunch of gender nonconforming folks or folks who, who, who don't identify with a gender uh, uh, as a man or a woman. Um, and then there's also rampant sexual violence uh, everywhere. Um, folks are being thrown into segregation the minute they're stepping in and then being sexually violated there. Um, and, and it's under the guise of their own protection. I can have a whole long conversation with whoever wants to talk about this. Um, and then I'll, I'll also send over some resources to, to Sean so we can make sure to send those out that, that give you a, a broader vision of what policies in different facilities in different states currently look like and some of the very real experiences that some folks have uh, have shared either through surveys or through um, um, studies and, and the fact that like a lot of this is just commonly known within the trans community. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions within the trans community too. Um, so if anybody wants to have that conversation, uh, my, my contact information will be shared. Any Did other questions, Laura? Okay. Um, the other question was actually really um, perfectly addressed naturally. I think our panelists, we're all keeping an eye on the group chat as well. If you wanna just give everyone the option for closing remarks, then I think we'll leave it after that. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So with that, uh, would folks like to close with anything? I know that um, I, for one, so appreciate this really different type of setting that we're able to have because it also kind of just allows permission to have a different to tone in the conversation. Um, and I appreciate everyone keeping their, their, their camera shut and, and all the logistics seem to work out. But more than anything, I just really want to appreciate the expertise that our panelists were able to share with us today. I know that my se me hizo la piel chinita, um, and, and that means that you know I got goosebumps sometimes when folks were talking. Um, so there's just so much richness in here. I'm glad this is being recorded, and I hope this could, this could be shared with a broader audience too. Um, now, folks, if you would like to to share anything, also and also thank you to the Equality Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus for hosting this conversation again. I think Andrea ceded her time to Michaela, and I'm going to do the same. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I, I do actually want to say that I think that one of the most powerful things that the people in this group can do is to use your platforms, use your access um, in ways that expand and elevate the stories that have been shared and the stories that will continue to be shared about people's experiences with the police, with prisons. Um, in particular, from my time organizing with Southerners on New Ground um, during the Black Mamas bailouts, I really learned that there's so many buried stories of people's um, interactions with police, with prisons, with bails, with the criminal justice system. Um, that they keep, keep and internalize, right? And they internalize it about themselves instead of making it about a system that is broken, that actually did not want them to, to thrive. And so I encourage you to really open up your hearts, open up your minds um, and expand and elevate these stories because they really tell the truth. They really tell the truth from the bottom up um, and you can't get anything more powerful than that. Thank you. And just one last thing, I, I do want folks to recognize that the LGBTQ movement itself is not a monolith. Even within this conversation, we have folks that are a part of national organizations and, and more local grassroots organizations. And we have very different politics uh, when it comes to the organization itself. So when you're doing outreach, trying to see um, uh, what's, what, would the, uh, what would the impact on the LGBTQ community be? Think about these faces. Think about Mickey. Think about Andrea, think about Puneet. Um, think about 
all the folks that are connected to the work that they're doing that are closer to the harm that's actually happening and being experienced in communities. So I, I think it's also a responsibility on your part as staffers to do the necessary outreach um, to make sure that we're talking to those who are most directly impacted. If you haven't had a sex worker in your office, something is wrong. Um, specifically trans sex workers. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I'm just so inspired after this conversation, um, even more amped up to, to go and do more of this work. And again, our contact information is gonna be shared uh, through Laura and through Sean. Thank you so much, Laura, for, for the questions. And thank you so much everyone for attending. And usually we would stay and, and have folks uh, chat with us a little bit, but again, our contact information is gonna be shared. So again, just thank you so much. Um, Sean, I don't know if you wanna say anything, if not, I think we're good to, to kind of call it a, a day um, and then move on from there. All right, I think we're good then. So thank you so much, everyone, um, and, and please be in touch.